Today, a spotlight on French's forest. Hello again, it's Martin North from Digital Finance Analytics. Welcome to this post covering finance and property news with a distinctively Australian flavour. Today I'm going to take you through my analysis of French's Forest. That's a postcode north of Sydney's CBD. Quite green, quite leafy, but also an area which is under considerable transformation at the moment. So there are some quite interesting dynamics to look at. I should just sort of go through my normal reminder that this isn't financial advice, right? I'm just using my modeling to essentially figure out what's going on. But I use data from my surveys, I use data from uh, all sorts of other sources. And we've been modeling this for quite a few years. The data is very recent. The last surveys were this Tuesday. So it's, it's just worth sort of contextualizing it. So in other words, this is pretty up to date. And as a result of that, uh, I'm pretty confident about uh, what, I'm, what I'm seeing. Now, um, the way the model works is that I pull information out with regard to mortgage stress, the price trajectory of what's happened up till now, the buying and selling intentions from the surveys, the migration data that's available, and also economic CPI wages and employment. All of that data goes into the core market model. And that includes then some scenarios because uh, you know it's hard to know precisely how things are going to turn out so we run multiple scenarios and that allows us then to make some thoughts as to where prices might move based on where we are today in terms of uh, individual postcode state and regional level all right so that's the way the model works and what i'm doing here is drilling into french's forest uh, 2086 now you said houses and units um, units is almost a sort of not a happening thing right there's just a few but uh, um, so it's mostly houses, but anyway, that's the area. And uh, just to sort of re-emphasize it, you'll know, of course, 13 kilometers north of Sydney CBD in the Air Government Nor Northern Beaches Council. Um, you'll also be aware, I guess, of the rezoning that happened. Um, you know, new, new town centre, new relocated high school, lots of new homes, the upgrade to the roads, all that sort of stuff. So, you know, that's all, it's all happening. Yeah, the retirement villages is a thing now. And um, there's quite a lot of them with permission. Also, there's now easier subdivision than previously. Uh, so I would expect to see more um, you know, subdivisions on even bigger properties too. So I think it's going to get more urbanized and more, more dense than it, than it was historically. I included just a few pictures. Obviously, you know, that's sort of the entry into the um, um, shopping area and what have you. Um, the uh, typical back streets where, you know, a lot of um, sort of sprawly places, a lot of green, um, a lot of older style properties, um, which is you know, quite typical of the area. Um, also some more modern ones. And there is a modernization program quite often you see where people actually knock them down and rebuild them or knock them down and, uh, and convert them into something different. So it's definitely a happening thing. And of course, the main road through has changed the uh, traffic um, dynamics quite a lot. Um, previously, um, and also just to highlight that there is some um, office in similar, you know, in the business park that is in the area too, just so to make that point. Uh, um, and then just to make the point obvious, there is some flood risk in some areas in this area. And I just went and grabbed the, um, the map to show essentially some of the areas that are more at risk. Uh, this is basically um, probable maximum flood event, so it's looking at the worst case. But, you know, there are specific areas where people need to be a little bit careful. Uh, there was a report done, the Northern Beaches um, plain, uh, Floodplain Risk Management Study um, that they did. Um, classic picture on the front. <laughs> uh, and, of course, it's not just uh, historical, but actually there was some flooding and um, things like that, uh, even in the most recent uh, events. Not as serious, but there was a certain amount there, so that's that's the main road. Um, anyway, if I then go and look at what's for sale, so there's about 11 properties currently listed for sale at the moment. Um, there's a map showing the distribution in and around uh, Francis Forest. 
Um, and we can actually look at them in a bit more detail. Quite a few of them are auctions. I spoke to a couple of the agents there and they say most, most are going to auction at the moment simply because there's a lot of interest. Um, there is um, you know, some uh, subdivisions going on, like this battle axe here, for example. You know, that's uh, quite typical. The agent said there's got quite a few of those coming up. So there's more people subdividing. Goes back to what I said about the, the, the change in the planning uh, regs. Um, there are also the occasional apartments. So there's one here in Grace Avenue, which I um, found. So that's quite interesting. Um, again, no details of price. And that's a bit of a problem. There's almost no price information um, come, reported. Uh, not even location information reported sometimes. It's <laughs> often just, uh, you know, contact the agent. Um, so it doesn't necessarily tell you much. And um, my negotiation, one price guide, 1.7, 1.9. Um, these guides are a bit fl fluid, to be honest. Yeah, I think that uh, certainly prices have been moving up and uh, people are quite uh, aggressive on their asking price at the moment, which is uh, certainly what we're seeing. Now, in terms of sold properties, 29 properties sold in the last eight weeks. So that's quite interesting compared with the new listings. You know, there's more sold than, than, than listed. Um, and again, there isn't a lot of information. Auction, the last asking price is not the same necessary as a settlement price. Um, they just don't report the settlement price uh, until it's processed, which can be sometimes two months, three months, right? Um, so it's quite hard to know. Auctions, of course, they don't often declare, they actually quite often don't declare what the result was at the auction. Um, last asking price, 1.7, 2 million more auctions. You can see most of these are houses, right? And you go down the list, townhouses are there, houses there. Um, one of the agents said to me he's expecting many more townhouses to appear over the next uh, year or two because of this subdivision and this higher development. So the character of the area is definitely changing a little bit. Um, last asking price, last asking price, all houses, um, pretty much all houses. You can sort of begin to get the drift of where the asking prices are. You know, 1.9, 2 million, above 2 million, or some of them slightly lower. Um, depends a bit on the um, plot size too, because obviously some of the bigger plots um, have more attractiveness in terms of subdivision and things like that. Um, now, in terms of price trends, this is now my data. So this is based on all of the information that I have available. And we can talk about price trends. So if I go back to 2013, the median price for houses was about 930000 Okay went up by 18.3% to 1.1 in 2014, up by 22.7% to 1.35 in 2015, and up strongly in 13% 2016. And even 2017 was pretty strong, up 8.2 to 1.65. Now that's quite interesting because we've not seen that many suburbs with even in some of the areas of Sydney where you could say that it's gone up so consistently up to 2017. But like most other postcodes in and around Sydney, 2017 was the previous peak. Then we saw a fall in 2018 down 12%, a small rise in 19 and a bigger rise in 2020. So the median at the moment is 1.64. That's up 11.2% this last year. Um, now, obviously, that's a median. That means that there are some above and some below. And as you say, if you've got a big outside space and a pool, you're going to be probably above two. If you're smaller or if you're a townhouse, you'll be lower. Um, but that turns to an 8.2% gain or after inflation, 6.3. Now, those numbers are pretty good, even for uh, other areas of Sydney. So it's done reasonably well. And that 12.1% is quite a lot lower than a lot of the um, drops that happened in 2017-18. Houses didn't drop as much as units, but even amongst houses, this is you know pretty good. So I regard this as a relatively stable and therefore you know reasonably attractive uh, location, even with some of the changes we've discussed. Now, I don't know whether you've looked at the value of general data, but you can get all of the transactions of settled properties from the value of general. And I just pulled out the last six months because you can only get um, 100 at a time. But you can see there that there's you know, some, some 
um, indications. It also gives you the property area, so you can begin to understand how some of the larger plots, here's one at 777 square meters at 1.4, or um, 948 at 2.8. So the size of the plot does have a bit of an impact, not the only thing, but something, you know, whereas 481's at 1.4. The other thing to be aware of is, you know, there'll be the odd funny one like this one, 100. So why why that is listed as a residential sale, I have no idea. So, um, But the point there is that you've got to be kept careful with the data because you can actually find some funny ones. There's another funny one on the next page. This one here at um, 12A Ribra at 23 million. I have no idea what that is. Um, but um, I didn't you know, go into more detail. When I do my calculations and get the median, I knock out the really obviously stupid ones, right? And yeah, and basically my median is actually the median of all these numbers here, right? So that's the way it works. Um, and, and the point about the median is it doesn't tell you everything about every individual property, but it gives you a feel for you know, where things are, right? Now, I also then pulled out all the units for the last two years, and there were only Three, four, five, six, seven sales for units um, over the last seven years. So basically, it's not really a happening thing yet, but it will be probably ahead as we've discussed. Now, the overall summary then of the postcode, 2086, the current listings around 30 with 22 added in the past month. So there are more coming on. Um, the agents that I spoke to said uh, they do have more listings in the pipeline. They do expect more to come on over the next three to six months. And they also said that they thought that September um, next autumn would actually be quite um, strong in terms of listings. The listings are a bit down at the moment. They were higher in May 19 with 35. Most of the houses, about 98%, the rest units at the moment, although that is changing a little bit now. Gross yields from an investment perspective around 2.6%. So that's comparing the typical rental if you can rent it out for the whole year relative to the average price for the property. Fall from 3.4, so it's actually going down. And the net yield, which is including all of the costs of running the rental, mortgage repayments and things, about 1.25 and falling. So the overall returns from an investment perspective, just on a cash flow basis, aren't actually that strong, right? You, you, you basically, if you're a property investor, you're hoping for capital gain because you don't get a lot out of it in terms of revenue. And of course, if you have vacancies, that could be a problem. The rents for houses are rising. Um, oh, hang on. They're down, sorry, are down 6% in the last quarter. They have fallen. So ignore the rising. That was my typo. Typical rent of 780 per week. Unit rentals, where well, they do exist, are around 690, but they're pretty rare at the moment. Vacancy rate's about 4.1. And that's quite high relative to other postcodes across Sydney but it's lower than the 4.5% in mid-May 2019. There's about 26 vacancies currently reported compared with 30. So not a vast number, but given the relatively small population and low density, you know, 4.1% is a reasonable number. In terms of asking price, this is now wacky, and I'm not sure I totally believe the numbers, but basically there's been a huge rise in asking prices. Um, the agent said 43% over the quarter. Um, bit sceptical of that. 6% over the year, I'd certainly buy into that. Typical house price, asking price, about 1.8. Um, average settlement is below the asking price, so people are tending to ask big and drop slightly, around 5%, but it does vary a little bit. You know, some really popular properties. Um, the agent was telling me that he's had a few auctions where there have been a large number of people there and they've bid well over the asking price. But that does seem to be not universally true. Uh, and the intention to sell, according to my surveys, is dropping slightly, and I'll explain why in a second. But that's the overall sort of thumbnail. If I then look at my survey data, there's around 4,400 households there, or when 2,456 are borrowing. 901 renting, so you know the rental's a bit smaller. Um, there's around 700 properties for rent, a couple of fa dual family occupancy for some of them. And there are about 1,600 property investors um, in, in the area. Now, that doesn't mean they necessarily own a rental property here in this postcode, but there are property investors living in this postcode, right? 
uh, which is quite interesting. 48% financial stress. That's my overall top level cash flow measure. 48% higher than the national average, which is about 42. Not dramatically so. But if you drill into that, it's not really about mortgage stress. At 30%, that's lower than the national average. So the national average is sitting at about 40% at the moment. Um, nobody's really in severe mortgage stress. There's around 51 defaults possible over the next 12 months, but not certain. And the default rate's only 2%, so that's pretty good. So I don't think there are many people with a mortgage who are really going to fall over in the short term. The rental stress is what interests me got very high levels of rental stress. So I think it probably goes back to that issue of, um, you know, the rents dropping a bit and you know, all those things. But in response to what we're having here, people are finding it quite difficult to pay the rents. And as a result of that, you can see that some of the property investors who are living in the area are in difficulty. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean that they've got the investment property in this area, but they are definitely under pressure in this area and that means that they may have to do something either with an investment property or indeed in the property they actually own so that's one of the reasons so and again the agent that I spoke with said yeah he knows a couple of um, case studies where the homeowner is considering potentially selling their main property because the investment properties that they've got elsewhere are underperforming right so that's where um, in the short term um, it's probably it may not happen, you know, in the next two to three months, but later on, that's where they think a little bit of the opportunity may come. In terms of stress, it's relatively low. I don't think you're going to see many forced sales. Might see one or two, but um, there aren't that many people now on the interest and principal holiday repayments. Um, now, if I then go to my scenario, so this is basically the way I, I do it. So I have three scenarios. I call it my best case. So this is in the assumption that the virus gets under control, the borders open early next year, the vaccines get rolled out and you know everything's fine. And in that scenario, I'm looking, this is a cumulative number, 5% rise in 21, another 3% in 22, and then a slight adjustment down in 23. My longer term crunch scenario is the assumption that we might get more of the local outbreaks, that the international borders might not get open as quickly and we might essentially you know, stagger on. A bit like happening in Queensland and up in Byron Bay at the moment. Um, and then the other one is the second wave where we get something more like Europe or um, the US where we get huge amounts of... Uh, a viral. Now, at the moment, I'm sort of sitting more in the best case scenario because I think we've got it pretty much under control at the moment. Um, they need to roll out the vaccines, of course, but I don't think international borders and therefore things like students and um, you know international migration is going to really start this year at all. It's going to be next year before it really starts up. So that's going to put a little bit of a lid on what's going to happen in the short term. But next year, my assumption is that that will actually give a little bit of kick to to the market as a, as a result right and what that means then is if i then apply that with an 11.2 percent last year another five percent this year um, and then a three percent and a small correction we're looking at prices stronger 1.7 median in 2023 um, so some growth not dramatic growth but enough to um you know be interested um, and that would actually put it above where it was in 2017. So we're quite close to that already, in fact. As you see in 2017, we're 1.6. Well, I would suggest we're probably now there or slightly above. And so there will be some more growth through this year. But it really does come back to place your bets on the scenarios, right? If you have a view that the um, virus is going to take longer to solve, then frankly, the growth rates might be a bit, a bit, a bit lower. If in fact the virus gets fixed quicker and they open the borders quicker, then the growth rates could be quite a lot stronger. I've also factored in slightly higher unemployment now because job keeper and job seekers come to an end, and I've also taken on board the assumption that some of the SMEs in the area uh, will find it quite difficult in the next uh, three to six months, and some of them may fall over, and that's going to be another negative factor. So that's all in all in the modelling. And that is, in a nutshell, what I found. So the best case scenario, you know, if, as I look at the relative probability, I've got about a 55 to 58% probability of best case playing out at the moment. 
um, based on what I'm seeing with regard to the vaccines, control of the virus. The New South Wales government's track and trace seems to be relatively efficient at the moment, and they seem to be able to sort of get their hands on it. But I don't think that the borders are going to be open. I mean, I know Qantas were talking about July, June initially, and then they said, well, maybe a bit later. Uh, a couple of the other medical people were saying, don't think about it until next year. Um, I think it's unlikely because, of course, you've got to actually have the other country that actually is also free enough to be able to manage it. Otherwise, you're going to have too much transition, uh, transmission. Um, and we've already had issues with the... Um, the, you know the, the 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 hotels and things. So now I think it's going to be pretty cautious, and I also think that they might focus specifically on students to help the education sector first. So it might not be a fully open border, or it might be particular countries like Singapore or New Zealand. Although New Zealand is being a bit coy about <laughs> what they're planning to do. <laughs> So there you go. That's a quick summary of French's Forest. If you would like me to discuss with you on a one-to-one -one basis a particular suburb, you can reach for me via the DFA blog and ask about my one-to-one -one service. That's where I do a deep dive research on a particular suburb and can look up a range of information as I used typically in the show for that particular area, which gives you a bit of a sense of what may happen based on our scenarios, as well as recent information relating to property prices and overall economic dynamics in the area. So do reach for me, send me a message via the DFA blog if you'd like to follow up on a one-to-one -one service. I'm Martin North from Digital Finance Analytics. Many thanks for watching, and I'll see you again next time.